Karu Selbaratnam is the name that I've been called by, but uh, more commonly known as Karu. But in school, I was known as Selva, because that was my first name. Karu came about through sports. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I was born in a little town called Batu Gaja. Batu Gaja Hospital. Uh, we lived in a place called Malim Nawa. That was a little village. That's where we lived. And then uh, all my siblings were born in, in uh, Malim Nawa. I was the only one among the five who was delivered in Batugaja Hospital. Why? I don't know. Okay. Uh, when I was in uh, Malim Nawa, I was still young. I was born in 1941. And in uh, 1947, when I went to school, we were going to ACS Kampa. We traveled from Malim Nawa to Kampa for about not 47, 48, 1948. And then two years, two or three years in ACS Kampa. And then we had to go to Sri Lanka for a holiday. Those days it was called Ceylon. Had to go there for a holiday to visit my ailing maternal grandfather. So the whole family, you know, wrapped up, went into a, took a, took a steamer. Those days it was called SS Rajula. Sailed to India. It took us four days. We all arrived there and used up to use up the six weeks end of year holidays to be there and uh, to visit and uh, be there with my ailing grandfather. We expected him to pass away, die, you know. But the old man never died. He kept on living. Six weeks went by. One month, I mean, uh, two months, three months went by. And my father couldn't stay. He had to go back to work. So he left us all behind. And uh, it so happened that we then, because the old man, old guy didn't die, he was already up and, up and walking about and playing cricket with us. You see, that's how I took up cricket. So we got admitted to a boarding school called St. Anthony's College in Kendi. That was the only boarding school my father could put us in. So we studied in Sri Lanka, St. Anthony's College, for three and a half years, up to 19, from 1952, right up to 1955. We came back to Malaya, Malaya then, in 1955, when I was, my father had already been transferred to Batu Gaja. We ended up in Batu Gaja. And uh, my father admitted me and my immediate elder brother to ACS Ipo. My eldest brother was in Sultan Yusuf College in Batu Gaja, SYS. So we had to travel from Batu Gaja to Ipo uh, for about a year. Then my father got transferred to Ipo. So all of us moved from uh, Batu Gaja to Ipo. And then my brother had to leave as far as Batu Gaja. He joined St. Michael's and we were all in ACS Ipo. And when I was in Sri Lanka for three and a half years, I picked up the game of cricket. Okay, uh, cricket, as you know, in Sri Lanka, Ceylon those days, was a major sport. And uh, from there, I never took up athletics. Uh, I hardly, I, I didn't, didn't get involved. But only when I came back, when I came back to ACS EPO, I was involved in uh, helping out. I was in a house called Tago House, which is blue. Blue House, they get a name, Tago House. So I was uh, in that house, and my housemaster was a teacher called Mr. Rasa Dure, who was a state footballer. 
And, uh, you know, I used to help out in school sports. I remember 1955, I was like a water boy, helping out, you know, dyeing the singlets. Runners will give you the white shirts, white singlets. My job and another guy, Charan Singh, I remember him. Two of us were involved. We were dyeing all the T-shirts to blue, distributing them. And then at the end of the day, we could pick up all the rubbish, you know, at the, our tent, Tago House tent. And that was what I was doing for, for about two years. And then the second year, 1956, one of the relay runners, Chanmuganathan, who was an 800-meter runner, he was my classmate. Uh, he got injured, you know, while after running the 800. And when he was warming up for the relay, which is the last event of the day, four by 400, he couldn't run. So while warming up, so that is the last minute, you know. So I was some corner there picking up all the bits and pieces, the rubbish, the cans, the paper, putting them into the basket, you know, and cleaning it up. Then I heard my name being yelled, you know. Salvaratnam, full name, you know. Salvaratnam, you know. Hey, where are you? I could hear it, but I didn't pay attention the first time. Then it got louder. When it got louder, I got worried. Because those days, you know, we fear the school teachers. Huh? They are, you now we fear them. And we respect them also. So I happened to turn around. And there he was yelling, looking at me and yelling. Hey, he said, come here. So I had to leave the bag there or carry the bag. I can't remember. And I ran up. We were wearing khaki shorts. You know, those days school days, huh? Very long shorts. And then he told me, take out your shirt, put that singlet and go and run. I said, what singlet? I don't have a singlet. He gave me a smelly singlet, somebody's singlet. I don't know whose it was. I had no choice, but I wore it. He said, go inside and report to the 4x400. I never ran in my life in any race. And this is a 200 meter track, ACS Epo. You got to run twice. So I had no clue, honestly. So I went in there and reported, and they told me, okay, you are second runner. I said, all right, you just obey instructions, that's all. So I stood there, and then when the first runner ran, he came in, gave me the baton. I took the baton and ran. And when I ran, we were lying third. That I remember, we were lying third. So I just belted like a like a like a dog being let out of the loose kind of thing, you know. Ran. And I ran and ran. I didn't know what I was doing. I probably had so much of energy. When I reached the first 200, I was already abreast. And I didn't know that you shouldn't be running outside the outside lane because you're running extra distance. Didn't know all that. So I just continued running. And I don't know where the energy came from. And I overtook them. And I handed the baton to the third runner. We were already leading by about two, three meters. So somebody observed it. I don't know who it was. And uh, we won the race. We won the 4 by 400 without our star runner who got injured, you know. After the race was over, I, I saw stars. I, you know. But I, I was a bit tired, but I was all right. I continued with my, you know, the job. I had to continue with my job, you know, despite all that. So finished the day. Before we were dismissed, Rasadre called me. My schoolmaster called me, housemaster, and said, that was Sunday. He said, Monday, tomorrow morning, Report to Mr. Lee Hu Kiet. I still remember the name. Huh? Mr. Lee Hu Kiet was the sports secretary of the school. I said, report to him Monday morning. I said, what for? I said, die, report to him. Like that. That's how they talk to you, you see. So I went, lah. Monday morning I went. And he uh, admitted me, or registered me into the school 4 by 400 meter relay squad. 
he picked eight runners. See, eight runners were picked, I was one of them. Then started to, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three days must come for training. So I went, I went, and then you see, that's how I started to improve. In the initial stages, when you're a young boy, you don't know all these things about time management and all that, you know. You are just told what to do and you do. You see, so that's how we were brought up. From father to the school teacher to the headmaster, they're all the same. Though in the old days, lah, they just tell you, you just obey. Good in many ways, maybe not so good in other ways, but uh, it turned out to be okay. I uh, eventually in school, I played both cricket and I was spotted by an American coach by the name of Tom Rosendich, who happened to be around in 1956-57. And also Jesse Owens, the legendary Jesse Owens, came to the school to give a lecture. And I attended the lecture in the school, in the school church. And uh, it was a very inspiring lecture he gave. And I was uh, inspired by his talk how he became a champion, an Olympian. And all that motivated me. Tom Rosendich, of course, spotted my talent in uh, jumping, especially in high jump, then in the 400. And he is the one who told me, you can do the high jump, you can run the 400, you must be having some bounce in you. Why did, have you tried the hurdles? I said, no, I haven't tried. So he took me to the hurdles. Nobody volunteered except me. Or I didn't volunteer, I was forced to, you know, or scheduled. I won't say forced, scheduled to, to try it. So I tried. And of course, initially I was like a kangaroo hopping, but he corrected me. And uh, I must say, I adapted to it quite well, and he was quite pleased. And then he told me, to do the, to take up and be serious in the 400 meter hurdles. Because you're a quarter miler, you can do the hurdles. I think you should concentrate on this. And then for the next two days when he came to school, he was talent scouting, basically. Not only my school, he went to all the other schools. So that's how I got uh, picked. And uh, then when I went to, for school training, I was told to do hurdling. Then I got involved in the district sports, combined schools. Then, and then as a schoolboy uh, in 1959, when I was repeating my Form 5, I, I passed my Form 5 with a, not a very good grade, grade 3. So the headmaster asked me to re repeat because he wanted me for the school sport, athletics, and wanted me for soccer, cricket, badminton, all that sport. So I said, okay, I'll repeat one more year. And the first Malayan combined schools was held in 1959 in Penang City Stadium. And I went there and ran for para combined schools. And I won the event and I broke the, the national record, which was held by a certain guy, K. Luxman. So that was a big thing. I was the underdog. Nobody expected me coming from Ipoh to meet all these champions in Penang and KL and all that. So I won. And that was the beginning. From there, it became serious. Then the following year, 1960, I got picked to play cricket for Malaya, 1960, against Singapore. And then in 1961, I got picked to run in the Sea Games in uh, those days, Siap Games in Rangoon, 1961. I went there and won the gold as well. So you see, that's when it became a bit of a clash of events. Lah. Trying how to be a national, remain as a national. You see, it's not difficult to be a champion. The most difficult thing is to remain a champion. Everybody wants to beat you. And that is harder than running and winning. Right now, it's staying there, is, it's a, staying at being a champion is more difficult. And I had to combine that with, with cricket. And I was also a good, I would say, a, 
reasonably good hockey player. I had already joined the Navy. I became a good hockey player. I became a very good badminton player. So I was playing too many sports, you know, and uh, I had to decide. Then I got involved in boxing. And I became a boxer. Yeah, so it became a bit, uh, I was already in the Navy. Boxing actually uh, was also uh, by, uh, by chance. You know, when it rains, you know, those days uh, we used to run in grass. There was no, no other tracks, all grass tracks. And hurdling, you can't hurdle on the grass unless you got long enough spikes. In those days, there were no spikes that you can change, you know. We went to the Mawa Cobbler in, uh, along the roadside in Hilo Street. Do you remember Hilo Street? Next to the bridge, there's a tree. And there was the Chinese Cobbler, Mawa. So we all go and make our spikes. And our spikes, were the nails were all permanent. He takes the nail, cuts it, and fixes it into our spikes. That's how the, our spikes were those days. We had no Adidas and all that. There was one brand called Hot Spur. Uh, but we couldn't afford all that. Lah. You know, yeah, small school boy. I mean, in the Navy, I was earning only $45 a, a fortnight, $90 a month. And I was a trainee because I was a engineering apprentice when I went there for five years. I was in college. So with that sort of thing, nourishment was not very good. You know, you know military food. Huh? So there was a canteen there. The mama fellow by the name of Maidin. He was running the canteen. I think I owed him a thousand over dollars. <laughs> no money to pay him, but he was very good to me. He used to give me special food, you know, all that. And poor fellow, you know, when I went to UK and came back, I qualified and came back. I was searching for him to pay him back some money, you know, some money. But they, that flow was not there. His contract was terminated. I don't know where he went, you know. I think I owed him about a few thousand. Those days, I ate but never paid. But he liked me and he was, he enjoyed, he, he, he I think he, he wanted to, to give me the, you know, special food. You know, the mamas, they got at the back door, you go there, they got special food for themselves, they, he, I share with them. La. So like that, la, that was my life. And uh, my training in the Navy finished in 1965, five years. I ran all those years. I went to the 64 Olympics. I went to the 62 Asian Games. I went to the 62 Empire Games. Those days it was not called Commonwealth. It was called the British Empire Games. In 1962, I went to Perth. And uh, I ran in several national meets, state meets, you know, a lot of running, you know, plenty of running, too much to say, you know what I mean? But uh, I, my, my year track and field was culminated with my going to the Olympics in 64. I was 23 years old. Then the following year in 65, I ran the, MA, the national meet was in Singapore. And I set a new national record in the hurdles. And I won my 400. I was a national champion for the 400 meter hurdles and the 400 for five years in the running. Yes, he was broken in 1989. We did it on a very, uh, what do you call it, uh, tracks that were not fast. You know, uh, the one I did it in Singapore was, uh, was uh, what do you call it? Uh, it was not tartan, it was not bitumen, it was a cinder. Cinder is like, you know, powdery track. But it's hard and rolled, but it's not fast. It's a slow track. And I broke the national record 52.7. Yeah, so, and I ended up, and I gave up. I retired at the age of 24. Because when they sent me to UK, you see, those days, uh, you have to accept the fact that in, in, in Malaysia, Malaya, Malaysia, Sports had no future. There was no money involved. We had to pay our own money. I mean, when I went to the Olympics, I bought my own tracksuit. 
the tracksuit they gave me was a Bulgarian tracksuit that fitted a wrestler. They just bought it and gave it to us. They never measured us nothing. The only measurement they took was for the uniform. As far as the tracksuit was given, we, were, we couldn't wear it. But when we took it there, it was issued to us there, not even here. It was issued when we arrived there in uh, Tokyo. And when I wore it, it was so huge, you can't wear it. When you warmed up, it was coming down. So we had to buy our own tracksuit. I bought my, all the athletes bought their own tracksuits. And Tantri Jaga was very uh, good. He knew the Adidas guy, the Adidasler. And they had a booth in Tokyo. He and the coach Bill Miller together. Uh, they, that was the first time I owned an Adidas Spikes. Yeah, we, we went together, you know, Rajamani, Dato Rajamani, Nashata Singh, all of us, we were in the same squad. Yeah, it was, a, it was a tremendous, thrilling experience to be in the Olympics. It is an athlete's dream. But the dream could have been better if you had performed better. But, you know, the weather was not suited to us. We came from a hot country. The weather there, when we went at that time of the year in August, it was quite cool. In Tokyo, it was about 13 degrees compared to 27, 28 here. That time, the temperatures here were below 30. You see? Because there was not much deforestation in those days. Now, yes, going up to 34, 35 because of concrete jungles around us. So that was how it was. So I, I gave up everything. When I went to UK and I came back, I had to go to sea. I became a naval officer. I didn't become an engineering officer because I gave up engineering and I became a seaman officer to command ships. So, you know, so that was, that's another long story. Uh, I applied for it when I was in, uh, when I finished my Form 5. I applied for several jobs because that was the first thing that came. They gave me a free warrant to travel in by train. Uh, to Singapore, never been to Singapore. My mother said, don't sign up. But it was such a beautiful place, the base, naval base. And I liked that kind of military kind of life, you know, regime. So I just signed up. When I came back, I got a scolding, but it doesn't matter. My father was quite happy. My mother was very sad. What to do? Uh, can't please everyone. So that was it. And, uh, I continued with life. I had given up everything. Then I became a coach. I became a coach. I took up coaching and I was coaching the naval boys. And you know, when I was a coach, you know, I was very demonstrative. I was still young. Like hurdling. I had to demonstrate hurdling. Not standing there and telling them how to hurdle. I had to show them how to hurdle. I think that's the best way of coaching, you know, to demonstrate exactly how it should be done. And then uh, it so happened that in 1973, as eight years after I had given up, I was selecting the Navy team to take part in the Armed Forces competition where the Army and the Air Force are competing against us, all the three of us. Lah. So I have to select the team. So there was this 800 meters time trial and uh, I told the boys in the, in the trial, there were three of them, I remember two names, one name is Mahathir, the other one was uh, Jayasilan, the third one I can't remember, I told them, I will, uh, I will uh, be your pacer, I'll run the first 400, I'll pace you, keep up with me. And then I'll drop off, then you finish the race. So I, I ran and I paced them. And uh, we didn't run staggered. We just you know that ran in Katina. And uh, I was on the outside and I cut in and took the lead and they, had to, they followed me. And I ran at a pretty pretty uh, respectful pace. I think I ran the first 400 in about those days, about 60 seconds in a pace. La. 
hoping that they will run two minutes or below, slightly below. After I ran the first 400, I went on to take the bend so that I can turn around and see where they are. But they were not near me. And I told them, where, hey, I was yelling and running, asking them, where are you? Come on, come on, come on. And I kept on running. And I went straight right up to the 600 and told them, come on. I said, you know, waving my hand and running. And they were still not overtaking me. Then I said, shit, I only got 200 meters more to go. I might as well finish the race, you see. So I finished it. And I beat them. And I asked them, what the hell was wrong with you? I ran two minutes three. They were, they, I think, ran two minutes seven. I said, you're not going to win a medal like this. I said, you've got to be faster than that. Anyway, after that, what happened was at the team meeting, the other coaches that were there, the... They were the British, uh, Royal, British uh, Royal Navy coaches that we had. They were with us. And they said, why don't you take part for, also? Make a comeback and take part. I said, no, this is the last thing I want to do. I said, no, 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 no. But they were begging me, please, in the meeting, sir, you must run. And you... So, okay, lad. I felt sorry for the boys. So I said, okay. I'll take part. Lah. I'll run in two events only and the relay, that's all. So I ran the 400 meter hurdles, beat all of them in all the three, ra three events. Now, when you win like that, now you have to run for the armed forces in the national meet. The armed forces now picks you. So they picked me to run these events. I couldn't say no to them as well. I was trying to say, no, 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 I'll go as coach. You run, run, run. Orders coming from the top. You know, when you're in the military, you can't refuse orders, no? Okay, so it was held in Kwantan and uh, lo and behold, I ran the hurdles and I beat the champion. The champion was a guy called Kamis Awang from Sabah. He was a national champion and he lost to me. Then they picked me for the SEA Games to represent the country. Because they're a national champion, what to do? How to avoid it now? So I had to mix my life. I was married. My wife was pregnant for Rohan. Rohan was in the stomach then. And, uh, and with all the other things that I was doing, I, you know, it was a terrible mix. And uh, fortunately, it was held in Singapore and I was living in Jobaru then. So anyway, and on top of that, they made me the captain of the contingent. Not just athletics, you know, I was a contingent captain. So it became a big, huge responsibility. But it was a, a parting gift. I took it as yeah, recognition for my contribution to the nation. That's how I felt it. And I appreciated that. Of course, uh, then the SEA Games came. We were centralized here. Da, da, da. The SEA Games I ran and I was leading all the way and knocked the last hurdle. I knocked the last hurdle. I went down on my force, managed to wake up and, I mean, get up and hit the tape and I got, came out second. I was predicted to win, apparently. I didn't know that. Uh, the punters said, no, Karu is bound to win. I didn't know that. They told me that I would have made sure, man. Anyway, and that ended my career. Then I came back, I got posted to KL, to the Ministry of Defense in 1978. And then I joined the... Uh, I, I, 77 actually, I, 78, I joined the Royal Slango Club as a member and played cricket for Royal Slango Club and I was performing in the league and I got picked for Malay, Malaysia in cricket yet in 1978. So that's it, I played uh, 78, 79, 80, three years for Malaysia. I captained Malaysia again in 1980. Then I got sent off to Australia for a sports management course because we were building a sports complex in Lumut. That complex that we built in Lumut was at that time the single largest complex in the country. Huge complex at that time, 1980. So I was sent for a course to Australia. I went to Melbourne, came back. 
that time my wife was pregnant for Sean. You know Sean, huh? And uh, Sean was born when I came back. And now we were all posted to Lumut. And my career ended in Lumut. As I, I was the armed forces coach for about seven, eight years, coaching the armed forces team, both in KL and uh, in Lumut. And we had uh, lots of success in my coaching. I became the, also at the same time when I was in Lumut, I became the Perak 3A's, Perak 3A's chief coach. Like that lah. It ended up, yeah. Yeah, it is, it's a responsible uh, portfolio. The ultimate thing is, you know, you, you are doing it for the nation. Uh, that was the predominant feeling that I had, you see. We were not, in those days, we ran not so much for glory. Maybe glory was part of it, but glory to the nation more than glory to yourself. If it was glory to yourself, it came along, by the by. We never asked for it. We loved sports. We ran for, we were not paid. We paid, to, we virtually maintained ourselves. Unlike today, athletes are very well looked after. They are being paid an allowance. You know, and, and we performed. Huh? And you can see that the records that were set in track and field in the 60s and 70s, some of them are still standing. You know, Tantri Jaga's record took about 48 years for them to break. You see? So you can see that uh, Nashata Singh was another one of them. Rajamani was another one of them. So there, there, were, there were so many of our, our athletes who held records from those days. And it lasted many years, 20, 30, 40 years. There's nothing wrong. Something is wrong today, I think. Yeah, I, I think there's something is not right. Definitely, uh, there's something wrong in track and field. I don't want to talk about all sports because that's not right for me to say. But definitely, uh, uh, if you ask me about track and field today, there's something not right. I am now, right now, involved in uh, young talent. This is Young Talent Track and Field. Uh, I'm involved in a program that involves young children from the age of six upwards to 12, 15, 16. And we already started in Ipoh, it's already more than a year. We opened up in Slango now. <clears throat> and uh, we are also doing, they're not, not so able athletes as well. Not just able athletes, but even the Special athletes, you know. Uh, we had two athletes who went to Berlin for the uh, for the uh, Special Olympics. One of them won a gold. No, not Paralympics, Special Olympics in Berlin. And uh, these are athletes with special needs, you know what I mean? Not Paralympics. And one girl won the short part. The other one took part but did not, the boy didn't win. Uh, but we have produced athletes and uh, we are doing, uh, they are all from the EPO chapter. We have opened up the Slango chapter now. EPO has got about 120 over kids registered with us. Uh, here in Slango, we are just build, building it up. We right now got about 50, 60 kids. We are hoping to hit about 200 kids in Slango in time to come. And that's my passion now. The only sport I play now is golf. Tomorrow I'm playing 18 holes in KRTU. I play once in 10 days. Uh, then I'm not, not going for any British Open or anything like that. So I just play for fun. Enjoy it with friends. And then have a good fellowship after that. And uh, that's life. Uh, I do a lot of gardening. My wife loves gardening. Both of us do whatever we can. She's got her share, her part, I've got my part. You know, so we do it together. That's life. I mean, uh, I think the biggest sacrifice I made, uh, which I think I regret today, 
is not being with the family enough. You know, growing up, especially when my children were growing up, and my wife was still young at that time, I spent so much of time. and money on uh, sports. That time it was cricket. I gave so much of my life to cricket, you know, until the year 2003. Started playing in 1950s, and you can imagine more than 50 over years I was involved in cricket. And although I was a double international, I hardly gave back to track and field. Only now, I decided to drop cricket for a while. I think I've sacrificed enough. I'll, I'll give this part of my life now to, to the young kids, which I enjoy doing. So to answer your question, I, sacri I think I sacrificed my, my, my family, I think. You know, that is the part I regret. My wife won't deny it if she re if she reads this. She knows that I, I was out too often. Okay, today there are many remedies. Huh? People's psychologists coming and talking to you. All kind of things. Lah. But where in those days we had, we had nothing. I was all alone in the Navy in Woodlands in some bloody village. You know those days, Singapore was not a developed country. Huh? It was 1960s, it was Macham Kampung also. And I was in Woodlands, which is a southern tip of Singapore, in a lonely military base, huge base that ran for miles and miles. British base, British Navy, Malaysian Navy, you know. And uh, there was nobody. I had nobody. I was alone. My entire family was here. There was no one to come and tell me. I was training alone. I used to carry the herders myself, you know, and lay them myself. The hurdles were not fiberglass like today. They were made of solid wood and steel. I had to carry these hurdles, lay them around after training, carry them back. So that was the kind of life we led. So you talk about mental fitness. We did it our way. Nobody taught us how to do it. But you read, you learn, you watch you learn and then it, you run it through you. The only thing I remember is how you plan a race. Of course, you know, having gone to such international standards like the Asian Games, the Olympics, you learn by going there that physical fitness alone is not what makes you a great sportsman. You've got to have that mental approach, that mental attitude, strength up here means a hell of a lot. And we, we learnt it our way. We, we, we just learnt it by as, it, as time went by. There was nobody who gave us a lesson on that. But today, yes, we have so many books and stuff you can read, you know. Never give up. Never say you cannot. You see, you must, that, that's another natural thing that came into me. Never entertain negative thoughts. The moment you entertain negative thoughts into your system, you are a loser. And I apply that even at this age. I think uh, Malaysia today, there are only one or two sports that can really give you a career. I think the top sport that gives you a career, I think, is uh, badminton, which is not much money. I was watching the, the was it the Hong Kong Open, the race, recent one, that the, the ladies' singles player who won, she only won 150,000 US. And I also saw the US Open tennis, that girl Coco Goff won 3 million US. So you see the difference, huh? So we are not yet there, lah. I mean, I mean, I, I know we can't give millions of ringgit uh, dollars, but surely 150,000 uh, 150, for badminton 
at the at the world level, you can imagine what we can what we get in the national level. Well, not much. I don't know how much they get. It can't be, but that's one paying sport. I think another paying sport is soccer. Uh, a lot of the states, state players, are paid a decent salary or allowance, whatever you want to call it, and they are looked after quite well. Uh, I do not know about any other, I'm not aware of any other sport that can give you a career. I'm not aware. I, I like to be educated on that. So it's really not a, not a sporting nation like the United States or Australia or Japan where you can make a living. That's how it is. That's my, so for Malaysians, you need to think twice. I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't want to say anything negative. Uh, there may be others who are keen and want to make a living on that. Uh, it's entirely up to them and the parents who should, should be advising them. That's my advice. She was a young girl. She was only about 17. 60, 1964, she would have been 6, 14, 18 years old. 18, 16, something like that. And then I went off to the UK and came back. Then we separated for a while and made a comeback. I proposed, I went all the way to Tapa. She was teaching there. I went there and proposed to her. And she accepted. That proposing was like a drama, you know. I went up there, met her, and I said, I want to marry you. Would you marry me? Simple like that. But no ring, nothing. Nah. Just talk only. <laughs> I uh, was very particular with my my meals. Until today, there's a lot of things I don't eat. And also because partly due to sports, and the pocket money that I get, 10 cents, started with 10 cents, then went up to 20 cents. 20 cents is quite a lot already those days. You know? I used to save that money. And then the weekend, I take girlfriends out for cheap money. <laughs> you know, go to theater, hold hands and all that. Watch cheap money. Lah. That's how I spend my money. And uh, I eat uh, only at home. I never go out and eat for two reasons. I never liked hawker food. I, I you know, like, like today, uh, like up till today, I don't take pork. Although I'm not a Muslim, I don't take pork. I don't take uh, beef. I don't take cockles, krang, sotong, all these things I don't eat. I'm very particular. I only eat, the only meat I eat is chicken, mutton also. I'm a bit careful. I like it, but only on occasions. But I'm a seafood man. But my famous fish, crabs, prawns. These are the only three I eat. All the other shells and all that I don't take. You know? So, my life, I was a very homely boy. I'm the only one who go to school, come back home. My other brothers, no, they are going cycling, roaming here, roaming there. But they come back 4 o'clock. I come back after school, I eat in the house. What my mother cooked. And I remained like that for a long time. So my wife and I, we read, I take her out for Blanjala, I take her for lunch or dinner and all that. Yes, kadang kadang. Eh? But most of the time we eat at home. We eat at home. Not, it's nothing to do with saving money or anything. I'm a bit particular. You know, I'm particular about eating outside. Nothing. You can never have anything about me. Nobody can talk anything about me. Lah. Girlfriend got lah. But I was not a rascal, if that's what you're asking. I was not a rascal. Housewife. Typical house Sri Lankan wife. Very good cook. Do as what the husband says. Dedicated mother and wife. But she died young. She died earlier than my father. She, she had a fall. We were in a 
we were living in Manjog and she was coming down the staircase. She slipped, fell, broke her leg. And those days, you know, the doctors, are huh? you're talking about 1960s. Instead of the left leg, they did the right leg or something like that, you know. I mean, the doctors those days, lah, you know, <laughs> they were like that. So, whatever it is, there's, the, the, the surgery wasn't all that successful. She continued to have the pain. Then she had to do another surgery back here in KL. It, it wasn't successful. So, she was uh, wheelchaired for a long time in her life. She couldn't travel and she just died. And we were not there. All the boys were employed, working. They only come, you know, once, twice a year. Can't run away from our jobs. My sisters were too young, you know. Father was getting older. So those were the hardships. My mother is a Bhumiputra from, like Bhumiputra lah. Sri Lankan Singhalese. So she's, and then you look, you couldn't marry there. You see, you, those days were taboo, Tamil and Singhalese uh, marrying. So they eloped to Malaya and got married here. And uh, my mother is a Buddhist, or was, yeah, she was a Buddhist. She always used to tell me about the five fingers. She always said, there's a reason why. The five fingers are all not equal. God created it that way because there are different walks of life, different things in life. Nothing is similar. Okay? Yeah, God could have easily made it the same, but no. He made it different for reasons. Of course, like, you've got different, every finger has got its purpose. It's another thing that she said. So she, she edu uh, educated me in that way and always told me, always never ever be avaricious in life. Be always be satisfied with what you have. Don't be greedy. If you are given something, consider it a blessing. These are the things that I learned and I live up to it till today. I mean, I, I'm not a, you know, I live in a corner house. It may cost a couple of million, but it's all in the monies in the walls. You understand? I don't, I'm not rich. I'm not a millionaire. I'm happy. I've got four children, all employed, doing well. I've got seven grandchildren, all doing well in life. One, two, three of them are working. No, two of them are working. Two, uh, two of them are in universities studying. Two are on their way. So, I mean, and they're all, you know, and we are healthy. The important thing is we are healthy. That's the important thing, that I can still go and play golf at this age. I'm going to be 83 in January. So, all these things are blessings, isn't it? Shouldn't be asking for more. Correct? Right? I get a small pension and I live with it. Anwar wants to give us a bit more. So let's hope.